join us and discover beautiful beaches, rugged landscapes, pretty towns, desolate mountain ranges that sweep down to stunning lakes, unique architecture, history and folklore, no shamrocks, no shillelaghs and definitely no shenanigans, just make it Ireland. On Easter Monday, 24th of April 1916, Patrick Pearce read out the proclamation of the Irish Republic outside this general post office on O'Connell Street in Dublin. It was a momentous and ultimately symbolic action that plunged the centre of Dublin into civil chaos. Posters of the proclamation were pasted to walls and two Republican flags were hoisted. A joint force of Irish volunteers and Irish citizens army occupied the building which became the headquarters of what was to become known as the Easter Rising. Other buildings in the city were also occupied, as well as railway stations and a wireless telegraph station from which they sent the first Irish radio broadcast in Morse code to announce the declaration. Barricades were erected in the streets. Other Dublin landmarks such as the Four Courts, Jacob's Biscuit Factory, Boland's Mill, and even St Stephen's Green were also occupied. Various bridges were seized and telegraph wires and communication links cut. Some strategic locations however were not seized, for example the telephone exchange on Crown Alley, meaning that cut telephone lines were soon repaired. But this is one example of how the rising had significantly less manpower than had originally been planned. It's thought that around 1,200 volunteers took part in the Rising in Dublin. There were other events by rebels in other parts of the country too. However, the Rising should have been much bigger, except that a countermanding order was given by the volunteers' leader, Owen McNeil, causing confusion. Why did the Rising happen? Well, by the end of the 19th century, there was a new body of Irish men and women who had become disenchanted with attempts to gain independence from Britain by political means. By the time of World War I, the third Home Rule Bill, the other two having failed, was put on the long finger. Frustrations in making progress on Irish independence through a political route saw several militant organisations emerge, which culminated in the mobilisation in Easter week. So how did it all end? Badly is the answer for the rebels, but ultimately for the British too. The rebels surrendered in the face of overwhelming British firepower. 485 people were killed and more than 2,600 were wounded. Much of central Dublin lay in ruins, battered by British artillery. 3,430 men and 79 women were arrested, not all of whom were involved in the rising. 14 of the so-called ringleaders were executed by firing squad, James Connolly, while tied to a chair because of his injuries, and again not all of these were actual participants. During the 10 day period in which the executions took place, the public became hostile to the British and the rebels began to gain sympathy. This, along with several atrocities committed by the British army during the period which came to light afterwards, changed public opinion drastically. The result was that a rising that was initially supported only by a militant population of activists became a watershed in a new era of Irish armed struggle. The 14 executed men eventually came to be venerated as martyrs. Ireland's most violent years were now ahead of her. In the words of W.B. Yeats, all changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. Please take a second to like and subscribe if this video is interesting or informative.